Hey everyone, I think I can speak for a lot of people when I say that I am very happy that there are not supercomputing human looking androids running around in society because a lot of software engineers would be out of work. So let's take a look at this clip from Blade Runner 2049. So we see Ryan Gosling and he's this sort of android bounty hunter, but he's also an android himself, which gives him these sort of superhuman abilities. And what he's doing in the scene is he's looking for a pair of identical DNA sequences. So he's kind of doing a linear top-down look at each of these sort of film strips of DNA. And what he's looking for is to see whether any of these DNA strips are identical. If there are a pair that are identical, then he knows that there is sort of this anomaly injected into the system. So no two people can have the same DNA, so we would know that there was some sort of cover-up going on in the system. So he's visually inspecting every single one of these strips of DNA to see if they're is a match. And eventually he tells the computer, pull up number 2000 something and number 4000 something, put them side by side, and he visually inspects them overlaid on one another and he sees they are identical to each other. That's a match. So we're gonna compare those and look to see what the additional information about those two individuals is to look for further anomalies because something about that is not quite right. So my question to you now becomes, if I gave you a series of strings and each string represents one of those DNA sheets. I want you to design the most optimal solution to find an identical pair, if there is one in the set. So we could say something like this. I'm gonna say const my people. And this is going to be an array of strings where each string represents the DNA of a person. So the first one is going to be A, C, T, G, G, C, T, A, A, C, G, T, but there is going to be a pair. So this first one and this last one are actually the same exact string. So how can we use JavaScript to look through this array of strings and find the, the matching pair? So I'm gonna kind of go through like a brute force sort of naive solution. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by that and why that is. And then we're going to optimize it a bit and look for a sort of a more elegant solution. So right off the bat, what I know that I want to do is I want to, in some way, look at each string. And for each string that I'm looking at, I want to look at every other string and see if there is a matched pair. So first I'm going to look at this first string here and I'm going to compare every other string against it to see if there's a pair. If there's not, what I want to do is I want to move on to the next string and I'm going to look at this string and compare every other string against that string to see if there's a pair and so on and so forth. So the way that we can do this is we can use nested for loops. I'm gonna scaffold out my approach using a function, I'm going to call it find DNA pair, something like that. That is going to take in an array. And this array that I'm going to pass into this function is going to be this my people array. Okay, so that when I later call this function find DNA pair and pass in my people, that will evaluate this code. And I actually do want to see outputted to my terminal, out, outputted to my console, what the result of calling this function will be. So I'm gonna say console log, find DNA pair, my people. So what do we want this function to do? Well, remember what I said earlier, we want to look at each string and for each string, look at every other string. So I'm going to create a very simple for loop. It's gonna loop over the strings in the array. So I'm gonna say for, let i equals zero, i is less than array length, increment i. And now every iteration of this for loop will look at one of these strings in the array. So what I'm going to do is in order to know the current string that I'm looking at in any given iteration of that loop, I'm just gonna give it its own variable. So I'm gonna say const um, current DNA string is going to be array at i. Now what I want to do is for that current DNA string, I also want to 
Remember that I'm looking at that one, but also look at every other string. So I'm going to have to create another loop inside of this. I'm going to create a second for loop. And just by convention, I'm going to say J equals zero. That's usually what we do with nested for loops. I is less than, again, array length. We're looping over every element of the input array. And now I'm going to break out the current element that we're looking at in the inner loop with its own variable as well. So I'm gonna say const, let's say second DNA string. And that's going to be array at J. So we have this outer loop and it's looking at each element of the array. And then for each element of the array, we are also looking at with the inner loop, every element of the array. So what we want to do is as we are using this inner for loop and we're looking at whatever second DNA string is, we want to check whether second DNA string is the same string as current DNA string. Maybe we can say first DNA string. So we want to check whether these are the same string. Now, the only thing that we have to watch out for here is in the outer loop, we are looking at every element of the array. And in the inner loop, we are also looking at every element of the array. We need to account for the possibility that at some point in time, both first DNA string and second DNA string are going to both point to the same string in the array, which would be sort of a false positive. If both of those come up as saying, yes, this is the same string, but they are in fact looking at the same string. In, in, in other words, they're looking at the element at index zero in this array. That's a false positive. So we want to account for that possibility. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to check and make sure that first DNA string and second DNA string are looking at elements at different indices of the array. So I'm going to say if the index of the first element, which is going to be I, and the index of the second element, which is gonna be J, if those are not the same index, and the strings that we are comparing against each other are the same string, so that's going to be if first DNA string is second DNA string, then what do I want to do? Well, remember in the movie that when Agent K found the pair of DNAs, that matched, he referenced their sort of lookup numbers in the set so that he could kind of find out more information about those individual people. So I wanna do the same thing here. I want this to spit back out the place in the original array where this first and second DNA strings originally were. So I want to actually return their indices from the original array. So I'm going to return that as an array. So I'm going to say return the index of the first DNA string, which was I, and I'm going to return it in an array. And also J is this is the index of the second string. Okay. Now what happens if this parses all of the strings in the array and it never finds a matched set as sort of like this default case, I want it to return uh, an empty array, or maybe actually, you know, let's just return a string that says no, match found, something like that. So let's go ahead and run this. I'm using Visual Studio Code with the extension Code Runner to see my output. And I do in fact see zero and four, which were a matched set. So, so far, so good. What's the issue here? If you're familiar with the, the concept of time complexity and sort of the optimization of algorithm solutions, what are we doing here in order to reach the solution that we found? Well, let's think about it this way. The outer loop is looking at each string in the array, right? So first it's looking at index zero, then it's looking at index one and then index two and so on and so forth. And for each one of those indexes, it is also looking at index zero and then index one and then index two etc cetera, etc cetera. so in the scenario where the matched set is actually the last two elements of the array so i just moved this top one down to the bottom here 
So now the match set exists all the way at the end of the array, which means that in order to find that, we would have to loop over the outer array and the inner array for every element up to the very last two elements, which means that in total, this nested loop solution could potentially, in a worst case scenario, run five squared times. What I mean by five squared is that for each string, it's running five times and there are five strings. If we're using big O notation and thinking about time complexity, this would be an N squared solution. So we will have to run the input size, which is five. We have five strings in the array squared times in order to find the match set, which is not so optimal, right? Imagine that, imagine that my people was more than five strings. Let's say it's a thousand strings with an n squared solution, that means that it's going to have to run a thousand times a thousand steps in a worst case scenario in order to find the matched set. So let's see if we can think of a solution that is a little bit more optimal, runs in less steps depending on the size of the input. Here we're using nested loops. So let's see if we can think of a solution that only uses a single loop. In other words, for the size of the input, that's how many steps we are running, give or take in a worst case scenario. So let me comment this out and I'm going to write a new function. So what are we doing here? We are looking at every string, looking at every other string to see if there's a matched pair. Well, what if instead of having to compare strings against each other in a loop, we could compare strings against some sort of data structure which can hold these strings but does not necessarily need to loop in order to find a string inside itself. There is a data structure in JavaScript that allows us to do what's called constant time lookup, immediate lookup. It can go straight to the element that it's looking for inside itself. That is an object. So we're gonna use an object to store the strings that we've already seen. So what we're gonna do, we are going to loop once over the array and for every element in the array, we're going to store it in an object. And we're also going to check whether that element that we are currently looking at in any iteration of the loop already exists in the object. If it already exists in the object, we know that we have a match pair. If we get to the end of the loop and it never finds a pair, then we know that there is no pair. So let me write all this out. I'm going to create an object to store our strings. So I'm gonna say const DNA strings. It's going to be an empty object. I'm going to loop once over the array. So I'm gonna create a regular for loop. And now let's, let's kind of think about the order of things here, right? So if I store the element that I'm currently looking at in the object and then do a lookup on the object, it's going to always be true, right? Because the element that we're looking at is already, we just put it in the object. So we need to flip that thinking. We need to first check if the element that we're currently looking at is in the object and then potentially later on store it in the object. So I'm going to say if DNA strings has in it the string that we are looking for. In other words, that's going to be array at i. Again, I could I could break that out. I could break out the current element that we're looking at into its own variable. So I'm going to say const current is going to be array at i. I like to do this. This is a you know pattern that I like to use just for readability. So I'm going to say if DNA string has inside it the current string that we are looking at, I'm going to Let's see, what do we wanna do here? Remember what we did before, we returned the indices of the matched pair. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm going to return an array containing the index of the first element, element that, which is going to be the element that was already stored in DNA strings. Now, how can we use DNA strings to not only remember the strings themselves, but remember the indices where they originally were in the array. Well, what I can do is I can make sure that I'm continuously building up this object where the key is the string. So let's say the string is going to be, you know, A-C-T-G-T-G-C-A, -T -T -G -G whatever. And its corresponding value is going always going to be the index where it originally was in the array. 
So that's how I'm going to consistently build up this object. So I know that I will have that key value pairs value to reference as the original index where that string was. So that's going to be DNA string at current and then the index of current itself, which is I. So if we do not immediately find a matched pair and return out, what we're going to do is we're going to store in the current string in our DNA strings object. So I'm going to say DNA strings at current. And remember, we want to save as its value, the index, which is going to be I. OK, so we're going to loop through once. And if it never finds a matched set at the very end, we're going to return no match found. So let me run this again. And I actually just had a typo here. So this DNA string should be DNA strings. OK, so let's run this. And we see three and four, which checks out, right? Because three and four, the indexes are the matched pair. OK, so looking good. So why is this actually more preferable? Why is this a little bit more optimal than our nested loops n squared solution? Well, the reason why, right, is because we have a single for loop. So for each element in the array, we're looking at that only once. And then for each element in the array, we're doing a constant time lookup. We're doing an immediate lookup in that object to see if it exists in the object. So this would be what we would call an N, O of N time complexity. In other words, a linear time complexity for each element of the input. It only takes one step. And of course, there's any number of different ways that you can refactor this. You can rewrite it. You could use a reduce method. It's kind of totally up to you how you want to actually write this logic. All right, I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you did, if you found value in it, feel free to subscribe down below, share this with a friend. Uh, I appreciate your time and I will see y'all again next time.